monsters. Welcome to another episode. Murder, murder news. You've landed in the true crime cult with all of the campfires and none of the conspiracy theories. Well, almost none. We occasionally like to entertain some pretty out there theories in Speculation Corner. If you don't know us already, I'm Angelina and I'm here with my creepy cohort, Aurora. Hi, friends. We're thrilled to have you. And if you want to make it official and join the MMN Commune for Real, please join us at patreon.com slash murder murder news and pledge any amount you like, whatever you can spare to show your support. In return, we will send you some murder merch, give you a shout out on the show, and you will have exclusive access to our monthly special video episodes for patrons only. You also get your very own baby goat, an official title like deacon or even grandmaster of goats. Now let's take a look at the true crime stories that made headlines this week. An arrest warrant has been issued for a 911 operator in New Orleans on charges of malfeasance in office and interfering with emergency communication. 25-year-old Precious Stevens allegedly deliberately disconnected a number of emergency calls without collecting the necessary information or connecting the dispatchers for aid. We don't know what she was thinking or why she would do something like this, particularly while New Orleans is in crisis. Stevens is still at large, so anyone with tips about her whereabouts is urged to call Crime Stoppers at 504-822-1111. Tipsters may be eligible for a cash reward. DNA evidence closed another cold case last week, and this one's a doozy. Authorities in Broward County, Florida, had been searching for the serial killer responsible for a number of beating and stabbing deaths around Fort Lauderdale in the early 2000s, stuffing the bodies into suitcases and dumping them on the side of the road. The grave of Roberto Wagner Fernandez was exhumed in Brazil and tested to prove that he was the killer who had eluded police for well over a decade. As investigators pieced together the timeline of events, they were shocked to learn that when Fernandez fled to native Brazil, his killing spree continued. He was arrested for the murder of his wife, but acquitted on self-defense. When he discovered his slain wife's family had paid to have him killed, Roberto tried to run again. He was actually a licensed pilot and decided to fly to Paraguay to avoid the law and his late wife's family. And that's when his plane crashed, killing him. At first, authorities thought he may have faked his own death, but it was confirmed to be genuine. Now investigators are working to piece together all of Fernandez's victims, fearing there may have been more than they're aware of. Wow. Yeah, (laughs) that's a lot. Yeah. (laughs) COVID-19 caused delays in yet another murder trial last week as a juror announced that they had tested positive for the virus. 46-year-old Marie-José Vio and 49-year-old Guy Dion are facing charges of conspiracy and first-degree murder in the death of two brothers, Vincenzo and Giuseppe Faldudo. The Crown's theory is that the couple killed the brothers on their farm in St. Jude, Quebec, as part of an internal conflict with the Montreal Mafia. Luckily, after disinfecting the courtroom and confirming that the virus had not spread to any other jurors, the trial was able to resume. Instagram influencer Miss Mercedes Moore was found dead in her apartment in an apparent murder-suicide with a man named Kevin Accordo, who authorities say she likely did not know. Drake was allegedly so distraught by the news that he decided to dedicate his last album, Certified Lover Boy, to Moore, whose real name was Janae Gagné. We'll be right back after a quick commercial break. Welcome to Hashtag History. I'm Rachel. And I'm Leah. And if you are a history nerd, or even if you are a history hater, this is the podcast for you. Even if history was your least favorite subject in school, we can guarantee you will like this podcast because we talk about all the things that your history textbooks did not. That's things like how Ted Kennedy drove his car off a bridge and was able to escape the car but left a woman inside to die and didn't report it until a day later. Or how the Pharaoh Akhenaten was so disliked by Egyptians that they literally purged his name from nearly all of their records and pretended like he never existed. Or how the FBI had a file on Frank Sinatra that was 2,000 pages long. Or even how on opening day at Disneyland, it was so hot and the pavement had been so recently poured that women's heels sunk into it. 
And we do all of this while drinking a custom-made cocktail specific to that week's episode. So grab a drink, take a seat, and hang out with us each week as we learn all about history's greatest stories of controversy, conspiracy, and corruption. Hashtag history can be found on all major podcast platforms, and that's hashtag spelled out, hashtag history history we can also be found on instagram at hashtag history underscore podcast welcome back now let's dig into our big story of the week this one doesn't necessarily correspond to this week in true crime history but the case has been investigated for nearly 20 years at this point so we could probably pick any day of the year to refer back to and there will have been some movement in the case on that day today we're talking about the disappearance of lisa marie young Now, before we get into our story, we just want to say that while our tone is light in the intro, we do take the topics we're discussing very seriously. We are best buds and we love chatting together every week and turning it into a podcast. We want to share that passion with you and to create a vibe where all of you feel like our best buds too. We joke about us friends forming a cult or commune, but that's not to diminish the severity of actual cult activity, which we do occasionally talk about in our weekly stories. We feel it's important to open up and talk about even the darkest aspects of humanity and the downright scary things that come up in the news. But we want to make it clear that our intention is never to sensationalize, and we always try to deliver these stories with respect to all parties involved or affected by the crimes we discuss. We always post our sources in the episode description so you can do some digging on your own if a story we present piques your interest. But you should know that if you ever feel we get it wrong, either in our tone or in the details of the case, we want to hear about it. We are more than happy to make a correction or give an update on a case we've discussed in previous episodes. So feel free to reach out to us at murdermurdernews at gmail.com. And some specific trigger warnings for this episode include sexual assault, injustice against the indigenous community, and possible snuff films. So if any of those topics are particularly sensitive for you, you may want to skip this one and listen to one of our other episodes instead. So if you follow us on TikTok, you may have seen our Missing Person Monday post last month about Lisa Marie Young. You may have noticed that our Missing Person Monday videos usually do pretty well with thousands or sometimes tens of thousands of views. When we first posted the video about Lisa, it had a measly 20, 20 views. We were especially bummed about it because a friend of an advocate for Lisa had reached out to us about creating a post about her disappearance. And we really wanted to see this post go viral and bring some much needed attention to Lisa's case. Sometimes, seemingly at random, our videos flop. We're really at the mercy of the inscrutable TikTok algorithm. We figured this was just one of those times, and we decided to delete and repost the video, hoping to break out of that TikTok funk and really spread the word about Lisa Marie Young. Another flop. And then we started to hear rumors of talk about Lisa's case being silenced, and we realized this whole thing might be a lot bigger and run a lot deeper than we had imagined. That realization really got us in the mood to fight for justice for Lisa, and we decided we had to do a podcast episode about her. This isn't the first time that a Missing Person Monday post became a podcast episode. You might recall us talking about the disappearance of Sierra Hunter in Texas. We chatted with her sister on the show, and shortly after the episode came out, Sierra was found safe. Great. (laughs) Yeah, it was such a great news. I had such a good feeling about it, so we're really excited for that. Love to see it. Yeah. So unfortunately, that's not what we expect for Lisa Marie Young. She disappeared 19 years ago. And although she has never been found, authorities are treating this as a murder investigation. What we're hoping for Lisa's case is a resolution. And it really feels like her case is as close as ever to being solved. There's some strong advocates for justice for Lisa who will not allow her story to fade into the background. One such advocate is Cindy Hall our guest for this episode. Folks like Cindy are keeping Lisa's story alive. If you live in British Columbia, where Lisa is from, you are most certainly aware of her disappearance. And that's a big part of the reason that her case is still actively being investigated after all of this time. 
At this point, Corporal Marcus Muntner and Constable Haley Pinfold from the RCMP's Serious Crimes Unit are the lead investigators on the case, and friends and family of Lisa Marie Young have full confidence in them. What Lisa's loved ones want most now is closure. They want to find her body, bring her home, and be able to have a proper funeral for her. This could be possible if someone out there offers even an anonymous tip about where to search for her body. Even better, of course, would be to get a conviction for the person or people who murdered Lisa. The chances of this happening improve the more we talk about Lisa and share her story. Because a lot of people out there seem to know what happened to Lisa Marie Young, but haven't been willing to talk. Knowing that this isn't going away might be enough to inspire someone with a guilty conscience to finally come forward and get this case closed once and for all. Before we get into more talk about the investigation, we want to fill you in on what we know about the night of Lisa's disappearance, June 29th, 2002. Lisa was hanging out at her parents' place in the evening. She was pretty close with her family. She actually lived right next door to her parents and often came over for breakfast or dinner or just to chat with them. Lisa was about to move out of her building and into a new apartment, which she was pretty excited about, and her parents were going to help her move the next day. She was also excited about starting a new job at a call center, which was a departure from the bartending and food service gig she'd had before. Lisa was 21 years old and just kind of coming into her adult life and setting goals for the future. She was thinking about going to college for sports broadcasting. Of course, Lisa lit up the room as she walked in, her fire burned brightly and she touched a lot of people. When Lisa left her parents' apartment that night, she was headed out to celebrate a friend's birthday. She took birthdays very seriously. Basically, if it was your birthday, she was going to show up for you, even if she was moving the next day. So that night was her friend Dallas Holly's birthday celebration. Some friends got together at the Jungle Cabaret nightclub in Nanaimo, British Columbia, which is now called Evolve. After the club, everyone went to one house party and then another. At this point, it's late night, early morning. They've been out all night, and Lisa's hungry. Lisa was a vegetarian, and she couldn't find anything veg-friendly to eat at the party. A guy at the party named Christopher William Adair offered to give her a ride to a nearby fast food place. Lisa and her friends didn't know this guy. They had just met him that night, but I guess he seemed nice enough and had been hanging out with them as they went from party to party. So Lisa accepted his offer of a ride to go get food. The last time Lisa's friends saw her was as she was leaving that party with Christopher in a red Jaguar. But Lisa's friend Dallas heard from her again that night. She called to say that she never got food and that this guy seemed to be taking her to another party instead. And then she later texted him from the back of Adair's car parked in a driveway. Can you come get me? They won't let me leave, she said. We don't know what happened next. That's the missing piece of the puzzle that authorities are still putting together. But it does seem like Lisa was murdered. It also seems like there may be some truth to some of the terrifying rumors that have been going around about Lisa's death ever since that night. We'll get back to that. Unfortunately, Dallas decided he was too drunk to pick her up. Even more unfortunately, nobody can go back and ask him why he didn't send someone else to pick her up or phone the police when his friend was in trouble. He died in 2018 when he was struck by a car as he walked along the side of a BC highway in the middle of the night with a friend. Super unfortunate. Yeah. There have been a number of barriers standing in the way of justice for Lisa, her indigenous heritage probably first and foremost. As we know, there's an ongoing crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, which has made a particular impact in Western Canada. We read articles with quotes from Carol Frank, Lisa's aunt. Carol said Lisa's mother, Joanne Martin, hid that Lisa was indigenous at first because she didn't want it to affect how her case was handled. But of course, it did anyway, which is so, so sad. Yeah. Prejudice led early investigators to assume that Lisa was out on a bender and probably shouldn't be considered a missing person. The very same attitude could lead a predator to target someone like Lisa. Investigators didn't question the driver, Christopher William Adair, until two months after Lisa was reported missing. Wow. Rumor has it that the Jaguar was steam clean before that, which is entirely possible. 
That Jaguar didn't even belong to Christopher, however. It belonged to his grandmother, Jerry. Jerry got so miffed about her grandson being questioned about a missing woman that she threatened to sue the police department if they didn't leave him alone. And then they pretty much did. White privilege. Yeah. I guess she was a pretty well-connected lady. Consider that another barrier to justice. But not anymore. Jerry died in 2011. Sadly, I would say that Christopher Adair is still not likely to be questioned again anytime soon. According to the podcast Island Crime, Christopher is now living in Japan. Host of Island Crime, Laura Palmer, also said that she heard he was following the case from afar and might even listen to podcasts. I hope he hears all the podcasts out there mentioning Lisa and it pushes him closer to talking about what he knows about Lisa's murder. Island Crime, by the way, dedicated the entire first season to Lisa Marie Young, and we definitely recommend that you give it a listen. There's so much more to this case than what we have time for, and host Laura Palmer really does it justice, and she has such Mm -hmm. an amazing name. Oh, yeah. (laughs) That's the first thing that hooked me, of course, because I'm a huge uh, Twin Peaks fan. And, uh, you know, that I think helps spread the story a little bit, just that she's got that name and people want to look into it. So that's really cool. Um, But yeah, the podcast is great regardless. (laughs) Lisa's mom, Joanne, advocated tirelessly for her daughter until her death in 2017. Our guest, Cindy Hall, has tried her best to pick up where Joanne left off. Let's get to the interview with Cindy so she can shed some more light on what Lisa was like, how the investigation has been going, and why she's still hopeful that Lisa's loved ones will find closure. We are thrilled to have the opportunity to chat with Cindy Hall, a major advocate for justice for Lisa Marie Young and for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Cindy has led marches and vigils for Lisa, and she knows the case inside and out. She's been in regular contact with law enforcement, with Lisa's loved ones, and anyone who might be able to shed some light on what could have happened to Lisa that night and what can be done to bring her case to justice. Thank you, Cindy, for all that you do, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Of course. Great. And Cindy, how did you meet Lisa and how did you become involved in her case? Okay, so I met Lisa when I was about 16 years old. My best friend was Caroline Bosma and she moved into Lisa's foster home. So I met Lisa probably the first day that Caroline moved into the foster home. And so we weren't close friends, but we got along. Um, We would hang out in the foster home together because there was three of them. And yeah, I just got to know Lisa that way. And then over the years, I still saw her. And then she ended up um, living with my sister-in-law, Tara Hall. And that's who Lisa was um, living with when she was moving out to get her own place. Mm. And and how did you get involved in her case? Um, Joanne died four years ago. And then that made me really realize that Lisa has been missing for so long with no justice and I wanted to do something. So I contacted Lisa's sister, Carol Ann, and asked what she thought if I planned a march and she thought it was an awesome idea. So Mm -hmm. then I reached out to Lisa's family member, um, her aunt, Carol Frank, and Mm -hmm. me and Carol Frank became friends. And then we just started advocating together and it just started by posting online and just holding like an event, which I've never done. Wow. And then we just kind of grew together. And um, she advocates like her sister, Joanne, Lisa's mm-hmm. mom did. So mm-hmm. we try to honor, like, we think of what Joanne would have wanted. And mm-hmm. how, like, and we try to honor those. I mean, just try to do everything we think Joanne would want. Nice. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about Lisa? What was she like? What were her interests? And what were her future plans? Yeah, so Lisa, every time I saw her, she was smiling. Um, Mm. She was always dressed up nice, like boots, jewelry, makeup, hair done nice, just always together. (laughs) Very fashionable. um, Yeah, she was. That's how I described her. Mm. Like, and she was, yeah. And, um, but she was also very athletic. Mm. So she was really into sports. And when she was younger, her grandpa, Moses Martin, took her to a Canucks game and that made her want to be a sports announcer so when Lisa went missing that was one of the things she was thinking about going back to school and doing oh wow so yeah she was um outgoing 
She liked shopping. She liked going to concerts. Um, yeah, she was just like a normal, typical, happy 21-year-old. Wow. That's amazing. Thanks for giving a little bit of insight. I feel like sometimes when you hear missing persons stories, we kind of miss that bit of depth about like what they were like yeah. and like that personality. Some, yeah. And I think that's so, I agree. so great to like remembering them for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. in that happy times and not mm-hmm. the sad times because we also yeah. think of when she was murdered a lot. Right. But she had a whole life before that, right? Yeah. 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 And that's what 40 Days of Fitness was about, that event. It was to celebrate the positive and Lisa's passion of, oh, that was the other thing. She loved fitness. Oh, wow. Okay. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, she was in pretty good shape. And yeah. You are now a major player in advocacy for Lisa, but you've not been alone in fighting for justice for her. Lisa's own mother, Joanne, became a reluctant advocate when she pushed past her discomfort in talking to the media because she believed that more eyes on the case would only help make sense of what happened to her daughter. Can you give us a sense of how many people are out there fighting for Lisa and who they are? Okay, so right now we have tons of support, but the core team, I would say, would be myself. Carol Ann, Carol, and you know, the journalist, Laura Palmer. Mm, yes. She helps so much and she's like a big support system to me mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. a lot of this is new to me and I like to run stuff by Laura and she just, she like gives me her honest opinion because I ask for it. So that helps a lot. So it's mainly us who do like the organizing, we do the group. Mm-hmm. But we have a large community like in Nanaimo that support us. It shows when they come to marches. I feel mm-hmm. like we're getting more people every year. And even during COVID, the heat That's wave. That's great. Yeah, it was awesome. We we're stressed about this year because it was like so hot here. COVID. Yes. Um, yeah, a lot of planning, a lot of like health stuff I had to follow. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, so the, it's made up of the team of us, but we have like tons of supporters. Like, That's um, great. A lot of Lisa's friends are coming to the group and sharing their stories now. They show up on marches. They private message us about how they knew Lisa. Mm -hmm. Um, We even have like cops in other countries um, follow the podcast, follow the group. Um, One guy in Ireland took part in 40 Days of Fitness. Mm -hmm. Um, We have a lot of our like politicians in the area involved. We got the mayor involved. So these people spoke at the march this year um what else do we do yeah we just have tons of support like people request lisa cards we have lisa masks lisa shirts lisa stickers so it's literally like a team like we're the core team but we couldn't do it without just the public's help in the community Wow, that's amazing. Um, And living in British Columbia and being um, from an Indigenous background yourself, you are right in the heart of the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Can you describe for us a little bit about what that situation looks like from your perspective? Okay, so like you said, I'm an Indigenous woman. I'm Haida Klinkit in European. Mm-hmm. And I think we still have epidemic mm-hmm. since the missing and murdered Indigenous um, inquiry report came out. They mm-hmm. had there weren't recommendations like they had to do them. Mm-hmm. And I forgot exactly how many were there. And I've read a lot of them. But um, in my opinion, not one has been done. Like right. they, the mur- missing and murdered Indigenous women report, they were supposed to create another task force. So what that task force would do is it would be made up of police and everyone. And then families like us can reach out for them and to ask them to look into Lisa's file or take the file over. And the task force is set up for women like Lisa, who had a lot of injustice Mm -hmm. just when she went first went missing. So um, that hasn't been done. I don't think any of the things have been done. Um, I feel that our government still doesn't care about Indigenous Mm -hmm. women because to me, they haven't done anything to protect us. Mm -hmm. So like they announced that there was an issue and then they continue to do nothing about it. Yeah. Mm. And so um, we are trying to get the task force to help with Lisa's file, but I Mm -hmm. don't think it's created yet. And even um, the lead investigators of Lisa's file would welcome help if it happens because they're open to like, finding Lisa. So yeah, I don't think the government has done much. It just feels like the same old 
issue. And people say publicly they'll do something, but nothing's really done. We're yeah. still disappearing. We're still being murdered. Mm-hmm. Um, men are murdered at a higher rate than women. So that really? hasn't changed neither. Yeah. 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 Except for this year in Canada, um, men and women, men and women homicides are almost similar. But usually it's more men who go missing and more men are being murdered. Wow. wow. Yeah. So kind of... Um, an addendum to that question. And what ways do you feel Lisa's Indigenous heritage has impacted how her case has been handled? Okay, so when Lisa first went missing, I think the police had their own bias. And um, because Lisa was Indigenous, I'm guessing that they thought she was off getting drunk and she'll sleep it off. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but a lot of the police tell us Indigenous women family that we're drunk or we wander off which is amazing how many of us wander off <laughs> gross so gross yeah. that they say I that know. um so there was a when the, she first went missing the cop didn't take it seriously didn't want to take a missing report went back to his office i believe joanne and don decided you know what we're not going to accept it mm-hmm. so i'm guessing they harassed the cop and tell the cop went and took the statement don't think anything was done so the cops, um, I don't know if they were aware of the racism or it was just like a subconscious right. thing, but I do think fully Lisa being Indigenous had everything to do with how her file was first handled mm-hmm. because there wasn't a search until September and mm-hmm. she was reported June 30th. Um, the car wasn't impounded right away. Mm-hmm. Um, Christopher William Adair was not interviewed right away. Yeah. So, yeah, the cops just formed their own opinion. Um, They had potential witnesses come forward. The cops said, no, we don't believe you because of your lifestyle. So they sent him away. So um, I think people tried to come forward right away with info, like the woman who called Dawn. And, yeah, um, the cops just had their own thoughts and they just kept them. I'm interested to hear like your opinion on that because I did listen to Laura Palmer's podcast and I was mm-hmm. excited to hear when she finally got an interview with police and I thought she did a great yeah. job interviewing them. But the question had come up um, if they felt that there was racism involved in the investigation. And I was expecting, yeah. especially in the wake of uh, Black Lives Matter and Indigenous Lives Matter yeah. movement this past summer in Canada for them to reflect a little bit and say, yeah. we could have done it better. But he's like, no, yeah. we, we did it. No. We did it perfect. We mm-hmm. we yeah. did her justice. We did everything yeah. we would have for a white woman. Yeah. And it's like, mm, absurd. I don't think so. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely so, um, not true. <laughs> I know. Marcus said that during the interview. And I think like, no matter what he thinks, I don't think he can publicly right. talk about his coworkers. Right. But yeah, I have brought that up and that's been said to me. So I drop it. Right. Mm-hmm. But. In my opinion, you can't really deny, like, if she was a white girl, would that have really happened? Um, like Paul Manley said, well, if she was the daughter of a mayor, uh-huh. and where Christopher William Adair, his grandfather, was actually a mayor at one point. Oh. He comes from a, oh, yeah. I did not know that. <laughs> prominent, um, wealthy white family. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, it is sad that the Nanaimo RCM, he won't acknowledge it. Mm-hmm. but maybe when the file's solved, they can acknowledge it. And yeah. um, I hope so. we, me and Caroline would love to have a face-to-face with those first officers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'll just bet. ask them some questions and just kind of express how this has impacted Lisa's yeah. loved ones and how a crime could have been solved years ago. Yet 19 years later, we're mm-hmm. still literally fighting and for justice right so it's frustrating Mm -hmm. um i think we should own our mistakes and i think the rcmp should be like yeah we made our own choice opinions yeah right but yeah i don't think that'll happen i would like marcus and Haley are awesome cops and they've been on the job since was it 2018 2019 okay but yeah i don't know how the previous investigators were Yeah. And it's interesting when you point out, you know, that it may have been subconscious. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. They need a little more perspective because uh, 
it's difficult to see when they're not indigenous people themselves that how no. the racism has permeated that yeah. you know subconsciously. And it's yeah. really unfortunate because, of course, as we all know, the first couple of days after someone's disappearance or yes. murder, it's are the most important. Forty-eight part. hours, exactly. So that's and that's um, all I think about. Right. And yeah. you know, within that forty-eight hours, they had people coming forward. Yeah. Right. And they oh, ignored so it. It's wow. frustrating. Mm. Yeah. So that 48 hours is the most critical. And I always think like, uh, what happened if Lisa was alive? Like, how long did she stay alive for right. before right. they killed her? Yeah. And, Could like, they have rescued that her? Time? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's a lot of like, what ifs. Yeah. So I try not to go down that path. Because, like, one day I got so angry, <laughs> I wanted yeah. to, like, scream at the RCMP, which doesn't help. Right. But, yeah, there's so much that could have been done. And the police investigation was a lot different years ago. But at the same time, like, the, it was basic common sense, some of it. So. What can you tell us about Luca, the cadaver dog? When and how did he get involved? And did he find anything helpful? Okay, so Luca is a three-year-old German Shepherd. He's called a general service dog okay. with uh, his specialty profile is human remain detection. Okay. So what Luca does is he goes with his handler, Dean Mir, and before they go to the search site, they actually um, stick little holes in the ground. I'll send you a photo because I've gone to them cool. <laughs> and looked after Cool. And what that does is it helps the scent come to the ground. So they do that. I haven't been to a search because um, they just don't want the family members there because it might put pressure on them. Right. And if they find anything, like, we wouldn't be able to see anything or yeah. because we've asked. So what Luca does is him and Dean will go around and search the area. And the holes just help spring up, say, um, if there was human remains. Um the smell would come up because dogs can smell in frozen ground and they can find human remains up to 30 years old. I forgot the oldest human remains. So yeah, so Luca does that. Um, He's been with Dean for a year and a half. He, I don't know if Nanaimo had a human remains dog before Luca, but they did when I first started advocating. Mm -hmm. Luca's just been with Dean for a year and a half. Okay. Dean's been a dog handler for close to 20 years, and wow. he's the lead dog handler of the Nanamo detachment. So, yeah, I've met Luca a few times. Um, mm-hmm. He's super friendly, very energetic. Mm-hmm. Um, he also does general duty, so he's also found a missing child before. He wow. apprehends criminals. So, yeah, he's an amazing dog. Wow. So they use Luca when they um, also have other teams like they, some teams, I think they check the soil. I can't remember all the details about that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it would be the forensic team that would also do the search. Um, mm-hmm. Another really popular thing they use for searching for Lisa now, which they just started when Marcus started searching, is um, ground penetrating radar. Oh. So they, the team comes from Vancouver to do that. And then they do that a lot. And then... Especially for, you know, how when they searched the morale, part of the morale sanctuary, Mm -hmm. it was a bit harder because of the ground there, but they used it there. Um, They used it on property, driveways. So they used that in with Luca. Um, They used to do metal detectors, but I don't know if they're still using them. It's the RCMP dive team that actually does the metal detecting because they do it underwater. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So um, sounds very thorough. Yeah. It is. Mar- I wish I, like, Marcus explains all this to me, but there's so much to mm-hmm. take and I always forget. But he did it way more, like, <laughs> sounding proper. <laughs> but, yeah, so he's really good. They um they tell us how they search. Um, They don't tell us when they do all searches. But if the search is going to make the news or if it's a property we're already aware of, they do tell us. Mm-hmm. Um, We don't know if anything has ever been found out of search. They will only tell us if human remains are found. So we never hear results on the search. And we only know of areas they search, like I said, if we already knew that place. Like, say someone said, hey, I heard this and this. Then we tell Marcus, and he's like, yeah, we already have evidence. So, yeah. 
So he'll confirm things with you, but he won't tell you like out of nowhere the the details. Okay. (laughs) No, yeah. And because it's an active investigation and Mm -hmm. in the past, a lot of leak to the police, Mm -hmm. he does give us a lot of info because a lot of it, um, say we know about it and it's just a peace of mind. Right. But, um, and then a lot of stuff he tells us that we can't make public, but then there is stuff that we can because we try to share with the public as much as we can. Mm-hmm. It's just hard to find the balance when it's an active file. So like yeah. we welcome questions in our group and we try our best to answer them if we can. Um, private questions, I try my best. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Nice. Great. And looking at some photos from the marches and vigils that have been held for Lisa over the years, one thing that stands out is a sign reading, no more lie detectors at a vigil in 2018. Can you tell us a little bit more about the role that lie detectors have played in the case and why advocates for justice for Lisa are upset about them? Okay, so Joanne, who is Lisa's mom, who is Lisa's mom, but she passed away, Mm -hmm. um, said that I believe... I can't name the one person who's always been rumored to be involved in her case, but I guess he was rumored to have passed the lie detector. Okay. And I believe Christopher William Adair took one too. And I think he passed. I'm not mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. So um, we don't want the police to use lie detectors with Lisa's file. And I don't think Marcus does. I think this was all in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And the reason so is if you're like a psychopath, um, you can easily lie on those. And I don't think it's like a po- foolproof right. thing. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe they're only as good as the person who asks them. Mm-hmm. I don't know a lot about them, but everything I have learned, I'm just not into them. Mm-hmm. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure the same inventor of the lie detector invented Wonder Woman. <laughs> What? Whoa, <laughs> sure that's interesting. That. Mm-hmm. So just because I'm not like, I'm pretty sure. Mm-hmm. So yeah, um, I just kind of don't believe in them because I don't yeah. think like, I think a lot of people can fool them. And mm-hmm. then maybe some people fail them if they're innocent, but stressed. Yeah. So to me, it's just, it's not a good thing. Um, yeah. And yeah, they did use them when Lisa first went missing. And I'm pretty sure they ruled people are using them. Wow. Yeah, you're totally right that people, if they're manipulative or if they're anxious, yeah. could give a, a yeah. different result than oh, yeah. reality. So <laughs> it's not that accurate. I'm sure you can get some info, but I don't think. Mm-hmm. And they don't hold up in court. Right. So there has to be a reason right. for that. Right. But yeah, and you can be like, um, I don't know, I just don't believe in them. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, other than lie detectors, Are there any other faulty or outdated investigative techniques or practices that were used in Lisa's case that you feel were a waste of time when there were more important things that detectives could have focused on? At first, no, because I don't think they were investigating. Right. So um, with, I don't know a lot about like what they did in the past Mm because I haven't talked to Marcus all about that. Now I do agree with all their techniques okay. that they're using because so they're I on the right track. <laughs> they're on the right track. Um, I don't, I'm not speaking, kind of speaking for Marcus. I do not think he'll use it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not a tool to him. Mm-hmm. I think him and Haley would do the questioning them themselves because Marcus has a lot of experience in serious crime and mm-hmm. Haley is like an awesome cop too. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Rumors abound about the case of Lisa Marie Young. While folks are digging for more info that can help round out the picture for disappearance, rumors can lead authorities astray and detract from the actual justice. Could you describe some of the dangerous rumors that have been circulating about what could have happened to Lisa? Okay, so there has been a ton of rumors online Mm -hmm. about Lisa. Mm -hmm. Um, The number one common rumor is that well-known brothers in Nanaimo, but one is deceased. And a bunch of other, I guess, bad people, predators, were partying at a house that Lisa was taken to and that she was um, raped and murdered. And it was supposed to be a mock snuff film, but it turned into a snuff film. Mm -hmm. So that's um, the number one rumor 
mm-hmm. I hear online, but um, I don't really think it's a rumor. So but I thought I'd mention it because mm-hmm. it is. But to me, um, a lot of it can be credible. I do think Lisa was taken to that house. I do think she might. I do think she was probably drugged. Just from what I've heard, I think she was raped, and then I think she was murdered. Um, they buried her behind the property and then dug her up and moved again. So that's a very, that's number one rumor, mm-hmm. but I do believe a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Um, right now, the rumor and just issue we're having right now is um, people are saying, like, don't trust the police and they're just bashing them. Um one person in particular says one of the investigators on Lisa's case is corrupt. Mm. So this person goes to missing groups. He writes it. Um, he bashes Lisa's group. He says we're all a fraud. So rumors like that, when you say like Marcus, Haley, and the team are corrupt in all this, um, that really hurts us and Lisa because we work so hard at showing Marcus and Haley who they are through the press conference um Dean does photo shoots with me like we work so hard and that's the other rumor um with rumors are hard because some of what people say are rumors I think is truth Mm -hmm. can be difficult to separate I guess (laughs) it is because Mm -hmm. like some of that rumor I can't verify then some I can't In an interview with reporter Kendall Hansen, and this was, of course, on Laura Palmer's uh, podcast, which is so fantastic, Mm -hmm. he mentions a video Mm -hmm. that may or may not exist of Lisa on the night she disappeared. What do you know about the video, and do you have any thoughts that you can share about what might be on that tape? Okay, I can. So I officially, like, Heard the rumors about the tape for years, but it didn't Mm -hmm. really get verified until Laura's podcast. Mm -hmm. In one of the episodes, she had a man named Dave, David on there. He also, his street name was Boxer Dave. And when he was in the car with a man and woman who were connected to what happened to Lisa, he said he saw two tapes on the floor and they were, um, I can't remember his exact words, but it's in the podcast episode. But he, somehow the two people in the car brought it up with them and they're like, oh yeah, we could have gotten tons of trouble for this. Uh, I can't say the name, but the person just left them like lying around the house or the yard and we're lucky Mm -hmm. we found them. Mm -hmm. And then David, um, he was a gangster when all this happened and he didn't really put much thought into it. And then a short time later, a woman approached him and told him what she thinks happened to Lisa, and she was hysterical. And I think she mentioned tapes, or he made the connection to the tapes. And he made the connection that it was of Lisa's um, rape and murder. Mm-hmm. So that was the first time I heard about the officially about the tapes from David. And then around, I think it was after Christmas time, um, a man named Bob, his street name was Later Bob, who's also on the episode. Mm-hmm. He um, contacted me and he sent me a photo of um, a tape. Like, you know, the old tapes that you would like put in your camcorder right. yeah. around this time. And he sent me a photo of it in a plastic baggie and it had um, hair in it. Mm. And he, Bob said that, um, like, what should I do? And I said, well, we got to give it to Marcus and Haley. Mm -hmm. And then he told me a woman gave it to Bob years ago and said it was the tape was of Lisa and the hair was Lisa's. And um, the woman died because I figured out who she was. Mm. So we can't talk to her. So then, um, Bob, I got him in contact with Haley and he gave the tape and hair to Haley. Mm-hmm. And then they sent the tape away to a company because when you watch it, they didn't know if they could watch it and they didn't want to wreck it. Mm-hmm. So they sent the tape to one company and they sent the hair for testing within an RCMP lab. And, um, we haven't heard the results of the taper the hair yet. Um, I don't know if Marcus will share them 
with us because Lisa's file is still active. Mm. So um, I do believe there was two tapes out there of Lisa. So I do think um, if this tape that the police have does have evidence on it, I do think there's another one out there. Mm. So we are asking people if you have a tape to please come forward because we strongly feel those tapes, tape or tapes can still be in our community. Great. And wow. how long ago was the first tape handed over to the RCMP? Like how long have they had that evidence? Okay, so I think this all happened at the end of December, January, February, March, April, May, seven months. Wow. Norm Pratt is a yeah. self-described intuitive. Um, what can you tell us about Norm's visions about Lisa? Okay, so I don't know his exact vision of how she died. I was mm -hmm. going to reach out to him. I just haven't done it. Um, mm -hmm. I believe in Norm. Mm -hmm. I do think he's a credible person. Mm -hmm. I believe when he said that, like, Lisa was trying to, not closure, but provide something for her family by mm -hmm. finding, like, the deer. I do believe that. Mm -hmm. um, I would love Norm to come to the island again now that we have more information and yeah. to see if he could help find her. Uh -huh. But yeah, I believe everything he said. And I thought it was amazing to listen to at first when I heard he was going to be on there. I was so skeptical mm -hmm. and I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. And then when I listened to him, I was like, holy crap. But yeah, I would love to talk to Norm. I haven't talked to him. Only mm -hmm. Laura, Laura did. I didn't know mm -hmm. like how he'd feel about me reaching out to him. Mm -hmm. I try to respect people's boundaries mm -hmm. with what I do mm -hmm. so but yeah I found it really interesting um I found it super interesting about the bag of IDs or a purse or whatever it was mm -hmm. right. that's that's part of his vision he uh um no they actually found it in person oh, they did. okay mm -hmm. and um I don't think it was investigated by the police wow that is so sketchy I'm sorry Isn't I've that... heard of like uh, real and fictional stories in the past involving yeah. collections of ID and that's a, yeah. never a good sign sounds never like it could be yeah. human trafficking or yeah. who knows and yes especially with the people involved mm -hmm. yikes yeah yeah so to me that always blows my mind and mm -hmm. that really stuck with me like I was I don't know if they ever looked into it, but it'd be so interesting mm -hmm. about the ID. And But yeah, just everything Norm said, I just, I don't know, I just really believed him. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is the missing piece preventing Lisa's case from being solved? Do you see an end in sight for getting justice for Lisa and closure for her family, perhaps if this piece is found or revealed or somebody comes forward? I think we're either going to find Lisa through searches, but the key thing to bring her home and have justice is I believe a lot of people were there to witness what was happening to her and maybe took part in burying her mm -hmm. and digging her up. So um, the key piece would be finding Lisa. Mm -hmm. So to do that, we're either going to find her through a search or like I said, like one of her killer people that were there when she was killed or buried her when they'll come forward. I think that's what it will take mm -hmm. or someone just stumbling on Lisa. Mm -hmm. I feel so, so strongly, and I know I've been saying it for a year now, mm -hmm. but I do think we are going to bring Lisa home. I even told that to Marcus when I talked to him last. Um, I've never felt so confident. I just feel like Lisa wants to come home mm -hmm. and that she's with us. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if she's either going to be found by finally someone stepping up after 19 years of knowing you can end suffering, you can bring Lisa home. Mm -hmm. That's what I think mainly, or just stumbling across her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So hopefully some of these people who um, have maybe reformed lives where they used to be involved in criminal mm -hmm. stuff and now they feel bad about it, or, you know, the, the, the facts that they know have just been eating away at them for all these years, like hopefully yeah. something like that is going to push the right people to bring information yeah. forward so That's that we there's want. a lot of loose ends. Oh, tons. And um, it's actually people from that past who were in that lifestyle and mm -hmm. criminals are coming forward now. 
Mm, in the right. case is very much the file is very much active. Um, Marcus is still doing statements. Um, he's still doing like talking to people, getting info. Mm-hmm. He just can't work it as actively because unfortunately the Nanaimo RCMP have five other murder files for this year. Oh wow. So they can't prioritize um those searches over leases because she is a historic mm-hmm. historical file. Right. And lastly, what can our listeners do to help Lisa and her family? Okay, well, listening to the podcast is like the first step. Mm -hmm. Um, We would love it if you join Lisa's Facebook group. It's called Lisa Marie Young. Okay. And we are super active in it. Like we welcome posts, questions, anything, as long as you're respectful and we're not going to hurt the file. We are so open to like communicating and just hearing from people. Mm-hmm. I recently started an Instagram account for Lisa. So I'll get more active on that. I've just done a bunch of posting. Mm-hmm. So it's called Where is Lisa Marie Young? Okay. So those are like the main two things, but I would say the group is the number one to go to. So another thing listeners can do is like maybe if you want to print off her poster request Lisa cards, um, mm-hmm. just spread the word. I've had, um, was it last year, a high school class did um, a dance for Lisa and they made Lisa buttons, Lisa stickers. They did a project on Lisa. You know, in high schools, they have display cases. Oh, yeah. So they did a whole thing on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and wow. Lisa was like in the middle of it. Um, uh. Next year... I will be going to a high school class and after the teacher gets his class to listen to the podcast series about Lisa, I'm going to go in and talk to her, talk to the class about her. Mm -hmm. So that helps when teachers get involved. It's actually my dentist's husband. (laughs) My dentist listens to it. (laughs) Oh, that's cool. He teaches at a high school. Hmm. So yeah, just like um, what other things have community members? Uh, Another community member named Lisa Watts, who's also an advocate. She doesn't live in Nanaimo, but she lives on the island. She made, um, you know, like little red dress. She contacted them and she made little red dress pins, but they're Mm -hmm. actually lime green. Oh. And that was Lisa's favorite color. Oh. So we sell them in the group. Cute. Um, what else? We, at the March this year, um, usually I would be in charge of food and drinks. Um, Lisa Watts and Frida Enns and their team, which makes up of um, two ex Picton investigators. Mm. And then, um, yeah, so they came to the March and they prepared like, packaged spaghetti, salmon, like all the food. Um, They did beverages. They gave out masks. So just community members coming together like that um, helps us a lot. Another inexpensive, easy way thing to do is you buy sidewalk chalk. Mm. And I write like, where's Lisa Marie Young on it around like busy areas in Nanaimo. Mm -hmm. So people can do that. But mainly just sharing, um, podcasts that we approve of um, (laughs) and listening to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just all that. And just keeping Lisa's name alive. Um, We have Lisa t-shirts people can buy. So Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, And if anyone has any information and does want to come forward, the best way to do that is to um, get in touch with the RCMP. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, we don't want people going to Crime Stoppers Mm -hmm. Because things aren't the same with Crime Stoppers and the RCMP. Mm-hmm. So if you go to Crime Stoppers, you're not going to help move Lisa's file forward. Okay. We need you to go directly to Marcus or Haley, the lead investigators. Mm-hmm. So you can contact the Nanaimo RCMP mm-hmm. at 250-754-2345. Um, if you are nervous to talk to the police, you can reach out to me on Facebook. And we can talk about, like... What happens when you talk to the police? How it works if your um, information has to go to court, if you're worried mm-hmm. about your safety. Um, mm-hmm. Marcus and Haley will also meet with people for coffee and they can get a feel of them before they talk to them. So going directly to the serious crime unit is the best way to go. Well, Cindy, thank you so much for making time to talk to us today. Thank you so much for all you do for advocacy for Lisa. It's been such a pleasure having you here with us today. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. 
Bye. Bye. <laughs> wow. What a story. Something tells me that we haven't heard the last of Lisa Marie Young. As her case gains traction again in the media, investigators are getting closer and closer to a resolution. We can't wait to report back with news of Lisa's body being found and her friends and family finally finding closure. Um, I noticed you made note about this too, but yes. I'm having so much fun watching this new show, Only Murders in the Building. Have you seen it yet? Yes, it's my favorite thing I've watched it's in so like great. ages. <laughs> what a perfect combination of things. So yes. it's uh, Steve Martin, Martin Short, and Selena Gomez. Yes. And they um, all live in the same apartment building uh, where a murder has taken place. And it turns out they all listen to the same true crime podcast. And then after the murder, they're bonding on that and they decide to start a podcast together. <laughs> Um, so I guess a lot of us in the true crime community can relate to that. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's really funny. It's really cute. It's more funny than, than scary, but, uh, Definitely it's not uh, scary yet. Yeah. Yeah. But it's very, very fun ride. <laughs> it's really great. And we don't want to give, of course, any spoilers here, mm -hmm. but if you are watching the show, I'm going to do a TikTok about it on Saturday and I'm going to discuss some theories about Ooh. who the killer could be. So if you want to nice. join in that conversation, definitely keep your eyes out for that TikTok on Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, have you been watching anything else? Yeah. Um, I also watched, I, I watched the entire series clickbait this week, which we mentioned oh, yeah. last week. And mm -hmm. so I finally had some time to jump in. Have you started it? Um, I, I just sort of started the first episode, but I didn't even finish the first episode. I was too sleepy. So <laughs> I'm not really fully into it yet, but I was curious because I know when you made the uh, TikTok post, you were saying, you heard a lot of great things, but it wasn't really vibing with you. Did that turn around as you persevered? It did or? turn around. It did. Mm -hmm. um, oh, so, did? Okay. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I really did not care for the first couple of episodes. Like the mm -hmm. main character, I forget her, Pia, I think, was sort of like yeah. rubbing me the wrong way. And yeah. um, like the main actors on it are quite good. You know, like they're, they're, they've been in other things. Like they're clearly experienced actors, but some of like the B mm -hmm. list people, um, I felt like the acting was just really bad. <laughs> it was just, yeah, it was really, really bad A for me. Cheesy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty cheesy. And so I was like really trying to push through, but like my husband sitting next to me, like, what is this trash? Like we can't watch this, <laughs> whatever. And like, he was not into it. So, mm. um, I kind of gave up on it after the second episode, I posted the TikTok. We got some feedback that it is good. Uh, the twists mm. are worth it and to keep going. So I did. Okay. And like, I feel mm. like maybe either the acting got better or I just kind of got used to it. I'm not sure. Maybe the story was just good enough that you didn't, you started to ignore the bad acting. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. That could be. And I'm not going to say it's like the best show I've ever seen, but it was definitely very engaging. So if you're looking for something to watch, you know, unlike uh, Only Murders in the Building, I freaking hate that Hulu will only give me a couple episodes at a time. Yeah. Like, I have to really sit and, like, watch eight <sighs> hours of TV. It's so, I, like, we, at, in 2021, should be beyond this, like, releasing one episode a week bullshit because we're in a totally different lifestyle these days. Everybody likes to binge watch. Nobody has time to be like, oh, it's Thursday at nine. My show is on. That's right. ridiculous. Come on. I just can't. <laughs> and so um, I liked that I could like just sit and watch it. And it's yeah. like, it's pretty easy to watch. There are a lot of twists. You'll find yourself trying to guess and guess and guess and guess and guess like who, like what's going on. Like there's so much at play there yeah. and like you will guess wrong. Like there's no way anybody predicted <laughs> the ending. Like there's just no way. <laughs> if you did, let well, me that's know. That's fun. <laughs> You're smarter than me. <laughs> yeah, we want to hear about true. that. <laughs> yes. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> You're a pretty smart lady. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough of that. <laughs> um. <laughs> Oh, I love a pep talk from Angelina. <laughs> that, that's all I got. It's a very, it's a very uh, curt pep talk, but that's all I, I have it. to say about I that. that. <laughs> <laughs> you are a real smarty pants. <laughs> I, I can't wait to tell y'all I'm going to be an extra on a TV show tomorrow uh, filming mm -hmm. in Athens. And I'm so excited to be an extra. It's always so much fun. How much can you tell us right now? 
Um, I really can't say anything, but um, once the show mm. airs, like once the season starts, I can definitely post pictures because I will try to get some behind the scene photos. And the scene I'm in, I believe, is with the main star who is quite famous. And, Ooh, um, and that's going to be fun. Yeah, I'm very excited. Mm-hmm. I actually met him like many years ago. I'll tell that story too after mm. after the show airs. But I met him many yeah, years ago at a theater in Austin, anything. Texas. <laughs> but um, mm-hmm. <laughs> this famous person <laughs> whose name... I cannot mention. <laughs> Very mysterious. <laughs> the show is kind of sort of like true crimey related. So um, I will have some, some, hopefully some fun stories. I was supposed to play a CIA agent on the show. And you'll all want to watch. Yes. Oh. <laughs> and you're not playing a CIA agent now. No, I'm not. I'm somebody else. Yeah, I'm not mm. now. Um, but but hopefully whoever I play will be just as interesting. And um, yeah. I will probably just be in the background if my scene even gets aired. But I'll have background photos for sure. <laughs> I, I cannot wait for that. And yes, y'all don't want to miss Aurora's acting debut. So we will <laughs> totally keep you posted. <laughs> <laughs> Expect not big things. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it's the first one. You never know. After no, it's this, not. You can just spiral into total fame. It's not. Well, no, the it's first, like acting. acting y'all, part, yeah. No? Well, I mean, I don't. I think this is just going to be like a featured extra, like um, like I've done in the past. Mm, but okay. um, y'all, mm. if you haven't seen Tribes of Europa yet, I'm even in the trailer. I made the cut for the That's trailer so cool. for Tribes of Europa, and um, I'm a sex worker, so You're- it's mostly my boobs. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> which is great. That's one of your <laughs> one of your best features. Yes. <laughs> um, um, and you were also a zombie, weren't you? Like a while back. Yes, and I was a zombie yeah. on Fear the Walking Dead on the third season. So, so third time a, being an extra, budding, and like somehow like they always make me right creepy. <laughs> as an yeah. extra, the most extra extra, <laughs> the most extra extra. That's your new tagline. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> the most extra extra that ever was. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that's enough murder for one week. If you need more MMN, you can always find us on the OG murder murder dot news for the latest breaking true crime news articles every day of the week. You can also find us on Instagram at murder murder news on Twitter at mm, murder news Mm. <laughs> Still on, <here>. yes. <laughs> on TikTok, where we posted a look at the historic case of the Cleveland Torso Killer, whose probable first victim, known only as Lady of the Lake, was discovered 87 years ago this past week. So that was a pretty big historical event. Yeah. I think that was one of the true crime stories that was like the first ones that I ever read. I remember reading that when I was really young and being like, what? Like, I can't believe there could be so many victims and in such a creepy way. And they don't, they never found this guy. Yeah, it's really a wild one because it, you know, it happened in the 1930s and, Mm. you know, whatever his intent was, um, if y'all don't know um, much about his history, go watch that video. But, um, you know, he would decapitate his victims and then they would find like, like body pieces, the torsos and stuff later. But they only ever found, I think, like maybe two of the heads or I'm not even sure if they're identified by their heads. But that made identification in the 1930s extremely challenging because it was just like the birth of forensic science and they certainly didn't have DNA and such. Yeah. And speculation about the intent was really interesting, too. I remember reading that many years ago because uh, the, um, the book I was reading it in was talking about how he might have been, um a doctor or someone uh, in training to be a doctor or surgeon and maybe was practicing some some new techniques Mm. on these bodies. So um, that's fascinating and horrifying, (laughs) but it's a super horrifying, really, really interesting story. Um, So you can also find us on Facebook where we have both our page and our group. You'll want to follow our page to keep up to date with all things true crime and join our group so that you can stay in the loop about special events and see the latest selection for our book club and RSVP to the next meeting. Right now, we are reading The New Jim Crow, and we'll be meeting on Zoom at the last Sunday of this month. And also, if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to leave us a raving five-star review on Apple Podcasts because it really does help us so much get seen in the true crime arena. (laughs) Yeah. 
help us on the way up and uh, we won't forget you. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here and have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you next week. Bye friends. <laughs>